Amen. The text this morning is from Psalm 103, verses 13 through 18. These are the words of God. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Father and God, we ask you to be kind to us now. We have gathered with your word before us, and we would have your word dwelling in us richly. Bring this about, we pray, because we dare to ask for it. In the name of Jesus, and amen. So this is the last in a series of messages on bringing up little ones, on loving little ones in Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do in this last message is gather up some remaining ends and odds and consider them in turn. We've considered the context of all child rearing. We've considered the attitude um, beneath all child nurture. And we've addressed some of the mechanics of discipline. And I want to finish by addressing a miscellaneous collection of any remaining significant issues at any rate. In the the text, in Psalm 103, the Lord does not look down on his children with contempt. Oftentimes, when we think about our failures as parents, one of the first things we default to is the assumption that God is equally a bad parent. We've been bad, and he's going to be angry with us. He's going to lose his temper, and so on. He's not, he's not like that. Uh, it says, as a father, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Understanding what God is like in reference to us is the foundation of understanding what we are to be like in our relationship to our Children, oftentimes we lose it with our kids precisely because we think we're, we're not being good parents with our children because we think God is not being a good parent with us. We have a fundamentally messed up attitude toward God the Father. And then that we, we perpetuate that. We send that on downstream. The Lord looks down on us, it says, with pity. The same way a human father pities his children. Verse 13. He does this knowing our frame. He knows what we can take. Now, as it happens, we can almost always take more than we think we can take, uh, but God knows what we can take. God knows what the outer limits are for us. He knows our frame. He knows how we're constituted, and he knows that we are but dust. He knows our frailty, in other words, in verse 14. We are here for a brief time. Our days are like the grass, verse 15. One brief summer, and then we are done with it, verse 16. But in contrast to this feeble existence, the mercy of the Lord is not feeble, verse 17. We are feeble, but God's mercy that rests upon us as feeble creatures, his mercy is not feeble, and therefore his mercy stands forever. We don't stand forever in our own name, but he stands forever, and he stands with us. His mercy, it says, is from everlasting to everlasting, to those who fear him, and his righteousness is bestowed on grandchildren, to those who keep his covenant, to those who remember his commandments, verse 18. We see here the general outline of this whole series of messages, the context of God's pity and compassion for us. We see his realization of our frailty, and for precisely this reason, his covenant which includes the means for forgiveness. Keeping covenant does not mean walking through this world in sinless perfection. If you think you're walking through this world in sinless perfection, then that means you're saying you don't need the covenant. That's saying you don't need God's mercy. Walking within the covenant is not the same thing as walking in absolute perfection. It means availing yourself of the opportunities and the... uh, provisions that God has made for you to deal with your sin, to deal with your imperfections, to deal with those times when you fell short. So his covenant includes means for for forgiveness and his law, which reveals his holy character. None of these things are dispensable. We are to operate, we are to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which means that we are to reflect what he is like and as, as we relate to him the way he is, 
the way he is revealed in the Bible, we reflect that to our children. Therefore, as dearly loved children, Paul says in Ephesians, be imitators of God. As you imitate God, your children imitate you. And they imitate you imitating God. If they imitate you imitating something else or bowing down to your own notions of what a good and godly parent is, if, if you've got your own ideas that you cooked up independent of what the Bible teaches and you're pursuing that and they are imitating you, then the result is going to be a mess. And if, incidentally, the real, if the result is a mess, then you don't, you don't have the op- option of saying, well, I don't know, if it, it, uh, we have a tendency, let's say, to think that all our relationship problems are the other person's fault. We think that if, if my spouse, if my wife, if my husband, if my, if my oldest child, if my oldest daughter, if my youngest son, if they would just do this, then everything would be fine. But that's not the way it works. That's not how it works. Lord, change me ought to be the prayer. Lord, start with me ought to be the prayer. Consider yourself. If it says in Galatians 6.1, if a brother's overtaken in a fault, if a brother's overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. You start running spiritual inventory when you're dealing with your family, if there's a problem in your family, problem in your marriage, problem with your kids, problem anywhere, you, and you run the inv- inventory, you don't start with the youngest and the shortest. All right? You don't start there. You start here. You start with yourself. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. You say, how? How can, you, how can you lay down the law on what good and godly parenting is and then go to the next uh, step and say, be encouraged? That, that's just overwhelming. That's discouraging. The encouragement is this. The high standard that God calls us to of bearing with our children, being patient with them, correcting them in love, not being impatient, all of that stuff that he's calling us to, he is that way with us. He is like that with us. He is not demanding that we be patient and he's impatient with our impatience. He, and you say, uh, th- this is the natural thing that's going to come up. Isn't, won't somebody, some lunkhead of a father, take this as an excuse for blowing up at his kids? Oh, God's, God's impatient with me and my faults, so I can just flare up at my children. I can just blow up at my kids because God's patient. I don't have to be, I don't have to be patient because God is patient with my impatience. Uh, that's, that's the kind of carnal reasoning that Paul smacks down in Romans 6. He says, shall we sin that grace may abound? Since God is gracious with us, do we take advantage of his grace? Do we bank on it? Do we assume that, well, since God is going to be really forgiving for me as a bad father or as a bad mother, since God's going to forgive and forgive and forgive, then I can just treat my kids with uh, a short fuse. I can do all that. No. If you, re- if you actually recognize that God is patient with you, if you actually see that he's being patient with you, then what does that do? That automatically generates in you a desire to be patient with your children. You want to be like him. If you are saying, well, he's patient, I can be impatient, you're reasoning falsely, and you're not really seeing his patience. You're not really seeing his loving kindness. If you really see it, if you really receive forgiveness, then you really want to extend it. If you don't want to extend it, you didn't really receive it, right? If you really receive forgiveness, if you really receive forbearance, if you really receive God's kindness to you, then the natural response is to extend it. If you say, I want to, well, I want to count on being forgiven, uh, but I, I want to treat everybody else as though I'm, I, I want to be the kind of person to them that God's not being to me, Jesus told a parable about that. There was a guy who owed somebody five million bucks, and the, the creditor forgave all the debt, and then the guy who'd just been forgiven went out and found a guy who owed him a quarter, and he started choking him because he owed him a quarter. Now, what did that reveal? It revealed that he did not know, he did not understand how he had been forgiven. He did not really, that was a transaction he did not grasp. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Forgive us as we, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God, you are my Father, you are my gracious Father. I want you to be, uh, I want you to extend your patience to me the way I'm extending it to my, my kids. And And when you've got that connected, everything really is connected and it overflows in gratitude, not in works, performance, and so on. So this is why you can be encouraged. God is a good father. God is a good father to you. That's why you can be encouraged. 
So be encouraged. Think in terms of generations and try to get your head and heart out of the day that you're having. Last Tuesday, I understand, was particularly bad, right? Uh, the dishes were up to here and the laundry was over there and out the front door and you've got all kinds of things and kids are running around, jumping on the couch and all, all, you're having a day. Look past the dishes, look past the pile of laundry, look past the swats that you had to give today for the same offense that you gave swats for yesterday or this morning or 10 minutes prior. Look past all of that because child rearing is generational labor. God knows your work and it's not in vain. Don't be, as you're bringing up kids, you don't want to be like the first grade, the first grader who, you know, when they, I don't know why they always plant beans in egg cartons, but there's a rule that apparently you have to, if you're going to plant beans to show little kids how things grow, you got to do it in an egg carton. You got a little bit of dirt. And so you put the bean in the egg carton, all the first graders come in every morning and dig it up to see how it's doing. <laughs> Well, it doesn't thrive, right? But well, why? Because the, the, the kid is so focused on how's it doing today and tomorrow and the next day that they're, they're measuring it in increments that are too tiny, right? If you, let's say a, a kid went away for a couple of weeks and came, was out of school and came back, oh, oh, you've, all, you've, you've seen how aunts and uncles who haven't seen you for two years are startled when they, when they see you. Oh, look at, look at what has happened. Think in terms of longer increments. Child rearing is a generational process. Think in 10-year increments. Think in 10-year increments. Now, of course, you have to parent in the day-to-day, but you you want to have your eye on the the, uh, culmination of the task, which is children growing up. Children are a blessing, the Bible says, but they're not a blessing. Well, they are a blessing, but this is not the blessing the Bible emphasizes. When the Bible talks about children as a blessing, it's not primarily talking about the patter of little feet around the house. It's not talking about kids in footy pajamas running around on Christmas. Now that's great, nothing against it. Yay, go footy pajamas on Christmas. That's very good. But it says the man is blessed whose sons contend contend with him, side by side with him, with his enemies in the gate. The whole point, blessed is the man who is, whose quiver is full of them. What, what is, fills up a quiver? Arrows, weapons of war. This is a generational thing. This is a generational thing. You want kids to grow to maturity, and you want them to grow to to maturity and have their loyalties intact. You want them to be loyal to your God, your people, your family. You want them loyal. And God has designed it to work this way. So God knows your work. It's not in vain. Now, there is such a thing as parental failure. We're not offering sentimental comfort here. It's, this is not a um, heal it lightly and say peace, peace when there is no peace. There are parents who really mess it up. There are parents who genuinely fail. But failure is not, measuring, is, not, is not measured by discovering that today is very similar to yesterday. That's not how you measure failure. But it's also true of all, uh, this is also true of all long-term successful enterprises. When you want godly feedback on how you're doing, take care to look in the right place. And if you're looking there in Scripture, be encouraged. Think of it this way. Uh, one of the great child-rearing books in the Bible is Proverbs. All right, this, it's all about a father saying to his son, son, remember this, don't co-sign a note, don't hang out with these people, watch out for the women, you know, watch out, watch out, watch out. But have you noticed, this is a, Proverbs is a child-rearing book. And do you notice how often Proverbs repeats itself? Repeating yourself is not a problem, apparently. That's not a bug. That's a feature. You're supposed to repeat yourself. You're supposed to go over it again and again. When you, if if you don't know how to finish wood, then you just lightly sand it for two minutes and then put the a stain on it, and you're done. You watch a professional do it. He sands it, and then he sands it again, and then he sands it with a different grade of paper, and he sands it again. And then he puts one coat on, and then he buffs it, and he puts another coat on. What, what's he doing? He's repeating himself. Why? Because he knows what he's doing. Right? Repetition, repetition is a feature. It's built in. Repetition ought not to be an exasperation to you any more than someone finishing a piano, finishing some high-gloss wood, is exasperated because he has to put the second coat on. That's not, that's not a point of exasperation. Every form of excellence embraces and loves repetition. 
You love the repetition of practice. You love the repetition of rehearsal. You love the repetition of going over it again. So why, when you are talking to your 13-year-old son and you say, are you deaf? Are, are you deaf and stupid? I just talked to you about this yesterday, right? I just talked to you and he's standing there like, I don't know. I <laughs> and you think, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Instead of saying, glory to God, it's time for another coat of varnish. <laughs> glory, glory, to, glory to God, I, want, I need to go over this again. This, this is the basis for you being encouraged. So, you need to understand the nature of the process. Your children are being raised up to maturity... And one day, they will occupy the same station in life that you currently occupy. This means that you must understand that you're dealing with a very different situation when your child is 15 years away from your home, from leaving your home, and two years away from leaving your home. When they're two years away from leaving your home, they're sending out college applications. They're, things are happening. They're thinking about it. You're thinking about it. You're making preparations. And... When they're 15 years away from leaving home, that may be in your mind. It ought to be somewhere in your mind, but it's not a front burner issue. Too many Christians, too many Christian parents get this part exactly backwards. They get it exactly backwards. When children are little and sin is still comparatively cute, it is easy to go easy on the discipline. When children are little, and they don't really wreck anybody's life if a, if a toddler pitches a fit. Uh, it, is, it is easy, so once you're out of earshot, it's easy to think of it as kind of, kind of cute, kind of funny. You relax a little bit too much. The roof doesn't fall in completely. All the sins committed are at a toddler level. But when your child gets old enough to seriously destroy his or her life, the parents then panic and clamp down. This is backwards, right? This is backwards. When your children are little, they ought to think they're living in North Korea. <laughs> they, <laughs> they don't know enough to use that, hey, mom, what is this? I bet little kids have to eat their spinach in North Korea too. Um, they, little kids live in a place where their lives are structured for them down to the nth detail. Good parents oversee Good parents hover, good parents anticipate, good parents are very much engaged in their child's life. But what happens is because little kids can run around and not cause, not burn the house down, not do great, uh, great deal of damage, oftentimes parents let them run loose, let them run free. And then when they get bigger and they're almost as tall as mom or they're taller than mom, and all of a sudden, they can get a girl pregnant. All of a sudden, they can get pregnant. All of a sudden, they can buy drugs. All of a sudden, they can go out and do something significantly bad. All of a sudden, they are capable of finding themselves with a police record. All of a sudden, that happens. And parents oftentimes go, ah, ah, ah. And then they, you're grounded, and you're, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. And they start piling rules on. They start putting rules on. Kids have lived with a minimum amount of rules, and then when they get to be teenagers, the rules start to multiply. It ought to be the other way. It ought to be the other way. When, the little, when kids are little, they love boundaries. They love enforced boundaries. They love predictability. They, they love having that kind of security, so give that to them. And as they grow toward maturity, as they're growing toward the point when they're going to be leaving your home, then you're taking rules off. You're taking, you're taking the training wheels off. If your 16-year-old still has training wheels on his bike, something is messed up, right? And it's probably with the parents. If your kid, 16-year-old son's out riding in the cul-de-sac, pillow tied on the front, pillow tied on the back, <laughs> three bicycle helmets and training wheels, that's, the problems are manifested in him, but the problems originated with the parents. He needs to be taking his own risks. He needs, to, uh, he needs to suffer his own wounds. He needs to make his own mistakes. He needs, he needs to do a, a number of things. And your opportunity as parents is to internalize the standard earlier. So you have training wheels on the bike early on, and then you take them off at a particular point. All right, so when you say, but, but he's, he's 15, he's 16, he's 17, he's, irre he's utterly irresponsible. 
He's utterly irresponsible. Right, and in about 12 months, he's going to join the U.S. Navy and he's going to be in the Philippines a year from now. Now you tell me what good your rules are going to do then. All your rules are not going to do a bit of good when he's around the world and has no self-discipline or no concept. Your opportunity as parents to, to teach your children how to internalize the standards are when the kids are little. And as they internalize them, as they own them, and you've heard me say before, your, your task is not to get your kids to conform to the standard. You can make them have the training wheels on, and you can make them keep them on. But your whole task is to get them to love the standard, not to just simply conform to it. And then as they grow, you're taking requirements away. As they grow, you're taking rules away, not because, the rule, not because you're 16 and now you get to sin, you take the standard away because you're 16, and we want you to stand on your own feet. We want you to follow God on your own. We want you to love God the way we do without someone following you around with a gun saying, love God. Right? That's, not, that, that's not loving God anyway. So external rules are training wheels, not a permanent part of the bike. So when you say to your kids... Okay, you're 16, you're 17 years old, when your friends want to go to this uh, stupid movie three. Um, because the first two were such a roaring success because America is the kind of place it is. And, they, and your friends, hey, hey, uh, can we go to stupid movie three? You want your child, you want your kid to say, no thanks. You want your kid to not have to check in with you. Why? Because it's stupid movie three. I don't, why do I have to go ask my parents whether or not I can go see stupid movie three? The, 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 the answer is right in the title of the movie, right? So what you want your child to be able to do is to have the authority from you to say yes and the wisdom to say no. Right? You want them to have the freedom to say yes and the backbone to say no. Now, you say, well... What, uh, let, me, let me give an, another example of this. Um, a, number of, a number of years ago, um, my son was leading a Bible study at Logos. He was out of school, and there were some boys that came to, the, to this noon Bible study, and, and Nate asked them, what, what's the hot movie in your class right now? What's the, what's the, and it was stupid movie too, I think. So that's the hot movie right now. And he said, what does that tell you? What, what does that tell you? And they said, well, it tells us that they don't have good standards. And they said, no, no, that's not what it should tell you. It should tell you that you're not leaders. If you were leaders, there would be kids in the class who went to see that movie, but they wouldn't dare talk about it because of all the grief they would catch from the kids who were being Christian leaders or who were, who were standing up for what's right. Now, just because we live in a Christian community, just because we have a Christian school, just because we have kids who are homeschooled does not mean that the influence of the world is not present and knocking all the time, saying, here, what about this? What about this? What about this? And you cannot address that with rules. You cannot address that with rules. Paul says this, what is, how, how many times does the New Testament have to tell us that law can't fix anything before we get it? Law can't fix anything. Grace fixes us, and when grace fixes us, we do the law. The righteous requirements of the law are met in us. Paul says in Romans 8, what the law could not do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending a son in the likeness of sinful man. Jesus coming in the flesh, dying on the cross, that's what deals with all the things that are beckoning to your kid. Jesus on the cross, the blood of Jesus, gospel, grace, God's goodness, Christ's kindness, and the resurrection of the dead, that's what deals with sin. Nothing else deals with sin. Traditional values, rules, wagging your finger under your kid's nose, does not deal with sin. Can't fix it. And what you want your kids to do is to grow up loving the God who loved his parents. I love the God who loved my mom. I love the God who loved my dad. And I want to love him the same way my parents love him. That's what, this, that's what you're aiming for. Toward. Now, you've heard me say also that grace has a backbone. Grace, there are, st there are standards that, um, that we have as Christians. We are to live according to those standards, but we're not to live according to those standards because of fear. We are to live according to those standards because we love and embrace the goodness and kindness of God to us. 
If we are doing it for that reason, then God says, well done, good and faithful servant. If we're just peddling harder because I've, I've, got, to, I've got to be a good Christian, whatever it is I'm trying to be, we're, we've got the whole thing upside down and backwards. And, and it's not surprising when your kids get the whole thing upside down and backwards. Education is central. In many Christian circles, it's commonplace to speak in this way. We don't want to emphasize academics so much. We want to focus on character issues. I've heard this a number of times. The problem with this is that it prevents a false dichotomy. Academics is a character issue. Academics is a character issue. Kids, uh, kids have one central, once they're in school or school age, they have one central vocational calling. They're a student. And working as a student is part of a central part of their calling. So to set aside academic work for the sake of character issues is really misguided. Picture a number of men sweating away with pickaxes and shovels, digging a ditch. Off to the side, we see one of them leaning on a shovel, and we look long enough to tell this is not a well-earned break. He's been leaning on a shovel all morning. We go over and ask him what he's doing. And if we did, we would probably not expect him to reply that he decided this morning to emphasize character issues instead. Character issues is much more important than moving dirt. Well, yes, it is. But how do you show your character? You need to be moving dirt. Right? You show your character by doing the work that's set before you. you. You learn character when you are giving yourself to the work that God's assigned. If he says he's emphasizing character instead of working, that's, the, that's precisely the thing he's not doing. So children ought to work. Children ought to work hard. The children ought to be taught to work hard. They ought to be taught to how to love the work that they're doing. So it's cheerfully acknowledged that getting the academic work done is not the only character issue, but it is an indispensable character issue. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Proverbs 26, 16. And this can certainly apply to parents or teachers as well. Another important issue. Remember that we are created in the image of God. And this means that we were created male and female. That is how we bear the image of God. Genesis 1, 27. He, uh, God created us in the image of God. Male and female created he them, it says. The image of God is born by us as male and female. The whole modern onslaught against this, where we got LGBTQ, BLT, um, <laughs> all the all the um, all the um, alphabet sexualities, God created us male and female, and this mean what this means is it ties right in with evolution, uh, atheistic, secular materialistic evolution, what it amounts to is a full-scale assault on the image of God. That's what's being attacked. It's not a matter of this person has this petty vice and that person has that petty vice. No, this is a full-scale onslaught aimed at God. God is in heaven. They can't reach him. God's, God, God they, he cannot be touched, but they hate him nonetheless. And so what they can do is they can attack his image. What they can do is they can attack what represents him. And what represents him is a man and a woman exchanging vows and promising God to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That represents the image of God like nothing else does. It's one of the most glorious pictures of the gospel there is in Ephesians 5. This is a great mystery, Paul says. But I'm speaking of Christ in the church. This is something that declares the gospel profoundly to a world in rebellion against it. So when God gives you a child, God gives you a little boy or a little girl, you are not bringing up generic human beings until adolescence, at which point differences make their first appearance. When Eve gives birth to Cain, she notices right away. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord, Genesis 4.1. Bring up your children, therefore, with stereotypes in mind. Now, don't apply stereotypes stupidly and woodenly, right? Don't be stupid with stereotypes. But to reject all stereotypes is equally stupid, right? Anybody who deals with boys and girls for more than 10 minutes understands that there are certain things that are happening at that level 
one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old kids. There are things that are happening at that level that have nothing whatever to do with social constructs. Right? All the social constructing is happening in the government schools where they're trying to drug, drug the boys into being something else. Well, they, we've, he's got staring out the window syndrome, and he's got this, and he's got that, and he's got, he's got all these problems, and we need, since we don't know how to teach, since we don't know how to love boys, since we don't know how to instill masculinity, we're going to hit them in the head with a chemical rock, and maybe that'll do it. Well, that, um, one of the things that's astounding to me is you look at government, government schools, how many of them have signs out front that say, this is a drug-free zone. Yeah, right. You've got a school nurse specially dedicated to, you're the chief pusher, right? You, you, because you don't know how to love and teach little children as boys and as girls. Bring up your children with stereotypes in mind, but carry them and apply them in all wisdom. Generalizations are true, but they are true as generalizations. Use them, therefore, to nurture your girls and not to insult them. All right? Don't use stereotypes as a way of insulting girls. Use them as a way of nurturing girls to honor, honor them where they are stronger than their brothers and to honor their brothers where they are stronger than girls because this whole thing is a design feature. When we say that boys are taller than girls, we should always say that's a stereotype. Right? That's a, boys are taller than girls. Men are taller than women. That's a stereotype. Now, we also have to say, if we're not applying it stupidly, not always. Some men are taller than some women. Some women are taller than a number of men. It, that, that doesn't refute anything. This is a generalization, all right? But the generalizations are part of God's revelation to us. God has created the world in a certain way. There are enemies of God who are trying to strike at him by trying to strike at the human family the way God created it. The last thing, God has set a pattern of good works for us. He's established good works for us to walk in. Among these good works, we must certainly include the good works that you are doing as parents. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are, the verses right prior said, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then it says, even, it, it says in 8 and 9, that we're not saved by good works. But it then says in Ephesians 2.10, we are saved to good works. So we're not saved by good works, we are saved to good works. For we are God's workmanship, it said, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God, um, God made in advance for us to do, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So this means that all your parental efforts must be grounded themselves in God's grace appropriated through faith. Your children will not turn out by works. Nothing turns out by works. If you set up shop in your own name, on your own authority, with your own strength, and you're going to make a name for yourself in the world, you're just building your own little Tower of Babel that God can bring down. God will sc scatter you. God, God uh, resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud. There are many traditional, parent, many traditional parents who are proud. They are proud. We're not like them. We're not like that broken family over there. We're not like those people who've got their kids in the government school. So we're not, they're proud. And they're pr they might have a thin veneer of Jesus stuff, but the central thing is pride. What you want to do is recognize that every one of us is a supplicant. Every one of us is a beggar. All of us are dependent utterly and totally on the grace of God in this. And you appropriate that, that grace through faith. You receive God's promises through faith. You don't receive God's promises through works. Your children will not turn out by works. Nothing turns out by works. Now, viewed from the side, your parental efforts to your, next door, your unbelieving next-door neighbors, your parental efforts will look like a lot of work to them. But viewed from within, everything proceeds from grace and to grace. And this is why you can extend grace to your children, because you are a nonstop recipient of it. You are receiving grace all the time, and you know that you're receiving grace all the time, and, and you're extending it because you, you get it. When to Apply this to any other uh, aspect of your, your life, your moral life as a Christian. So you're, you're working in a secular office, a bunch of non-believers all around you. You know 
let's say there's a particularly challenging time at work, and everybody else at work is setting their hair on fire and running around in tight little circles saying, what are we going to do if the sky is falling and that sort of thing, and you are calm, cool, collected, doing your job, laboring faithfully. Now, the guy in the cubicle next to you or the guy who walks by and sees you just patiently doing your, you know, singing a hymn under your breath and you just doing your thing, he says, it says in Philippians, that the peace of God, which passes understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God gives you an astounding calm in the midst of that kind of turmoil. And your coworkers see that calm. They, They see it and they don't comprehend it. This is the peace of God that passes understanding. What don't they see? What don't they see? They don't see you praying to God every five minutes. They don't see you in your cubicle typing saying, you don't... They don't see you taking deep breaths. They don't, say, they don't see you giving it back to God. God, I'm, this is another curveball. I'm, I'm having to trust you. They don't see you trusting in God. They don't see you dependent upon the grace of God as you are doing this. They, what they see is the grace of God holding you up. They don't see you looking to God to hold you up by his grace. That's what they don't see. They don't see that you would say, that was all Jesus. That was, that, was, that was not me. The reason I kept my head, the reason I kept it together, it was all Jesus. And you know from inside out, it had to have been all Jesus. It, it was all, all God, glory to God. But they look at you from the side and they see you calm, keeping your cool. They see you working hard. They see, they see all these external things. It's the same thing with your family. It's the same thing with your kids. Your, your neighbors look at you and they say, you, your family seems so happy, and your kids like being with you, and your, your, your kids want to hang out with you, and everybody, everything's so pleasant, and you're not yelling at each other all the time, and you can go places together, and you can do things together. Now, is this something that just happens accidentally? Is it just happens all by itself? No. You are giving it to God constantly. You're lifting up your kids constantly. You're praying constantly. Lord, forgive me for this shortcoming. Lord, d- deal with this. I give this over to you. Uh, this is a constant transaction between you and the Father where you are giving it over to God. God is answering your prayer, and other people think, because they don't see God, they don't know God, they don't see his promises, they think that you're the one doing it. And they might come to you eventually and say, how do you do it? And when you get to the point of that, that point in the conversation with, with them, you can say, well, here's, here's the secret. I'm not doing it. This is not, I, I work, Paul says in one place, um, that he, he works more than all the other apostles. Yet not I, he says, but the grace of God working in me. So the grace of God is something that actively works in us. In Philippians, again, we work out, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is at work in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. You're working out in everything you do, whether it's your vocation, whether it's your uh, advocate with your, your hobbies, whether it's your family, whether it's how you keep your yard, you're working out what God works in. If God's not working it in, you have no business working it out. And if God's working it in, you can work it out with confidence and assurance because he is the one who is going to be glorified. Our Father and God, whenever we come to your word, you give us many precious things. We know that unless your spirit accompanies us, we will lose what you've given us, and we're going to lose them right away between here and the parking lot. Father, your word promises that you will go with us. And so we ask you to fulfill this promise in the person of your spirit now. And to help us, we pray to you with the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Amen. The charge is a simple one this week. Try to refrain, if you possibly can, from reminding the pastor that he left out the prayer confession at the beginning of the service. We did have the silent confession, which is when you're supposed to remember your shortcomings, which is where I did remember the shortcoming. So I'm glad we had this little chat and that (laughs) we don't need to say anything more about it, right? (laughs) Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen.